So we're going to talk about iClicker Cloud. And in a lot of ways, it's like iClicker. And I think many of you have used iClicker before, um, but we're going to focus a little bit on, we'll talk a little bit about polling in general, and also what are some of the additional features we get with iClicker Cloud. And um, so what we're going to do actually is ask everyone to join iClicker Cloud as a student. And to do that, you should first create an instructor account. And you do that by, um, well, actually you can, well, if you already have an instructor account, go to this website and then just log in with your instructor credentials, but choose student. Uh, similarly, if you, if you want to use it on a mobile device, on an Android or an iPhone or on the web, you could download the iClicker app on your phone or your tablet or whatever. Um, and this, was, this is a setting for just today for this workshop. Um, and again, you may have to create an account first. So we're not creating our own classes if you want us to log in with well, us. We want to go through first. Yeah, you, we, you will be creating your own classes. But what we're going to do first is just go through this as a demo um, to show some of the things it does and let you participate and see it from the student side. But after that, we'll, we'll have you set up your own accounts for your classes too. So this was set up as a kind of general introduction to um, iClicker, both to see how it's used, but also um, how, it's, um, how it works from the student side. So I'll give everyone a little bit of a minute or two to get everything set up. And you can just go to iClicker.com to create your account too, if you'd prefer. I downloaded the app a while ago. I'm not sure if what I have is current or not. Well, if it's on your phone, it should automatically update using. I'm All right, iClicker student. In, so. but I'm not sure I'm in as a student. You you join? I did. So okay. I need to sign up. I don't assume I have a student account. Okay. Well, create an instructor account and then log in with the same credentials as a student. Okay. It just says I click your student. I'm okay. Then that's fine. Then use whatever login you normally use because when you create an instructor account, that should create a student account too. So that way, you you know the institution doesn't get billed for the student account separately. Okay, uh, so we have one person as a student. Anyone else? I'm, tr I'm trying. <laughs> I, I, st I, still, I still need to, uh, cl so I have my current class open, so I should close it off, I assume? Uh, it, it, I'm, it, sorry. You could just use a different tab, and I think that would work if you're doing I it on a browser. I don't know if I'm in as a student, but I'm seeing CELT workshop with statistics, class history, assignments, score, attendance. That, 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 that means you're in there as a student. Mm -hmm. With zero attendance. Oh, no. Oh, that's because it hasn't started. Let me, um, let me start it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start iClicker right now. I already have it downloaded on this computer. computer. It's available on all the computers on campus already, all the podium computers, but you can also use, why is that not scrolling? Huh. I don't know if I have a, do, would I have, would I have an iClicker password from before? Or would it, yes, if you use mobile apps, it would be the same as before. I don't if you allowed students to use mobile. I think I just downloaded it so I could get a sense of what my students But if your students were using mobile, using a mobile app, then you'd have an account because you needed to create an account okay. with them. Remember, it's been about two years since I've used any of this. Okay, so you, you can always log in with your email. You could try logging in with your email and then resetting the password. So I am going to, I've opened iClicker, and this is what you do. It's going to take minutes to sort this out, I'm afraid. Huh? I'm just going to have to not do it, just have to watch. Well, okay. Um, so 
I have three classes set up. The one I'm using this fall, one I demonstrated setting up in the last hour, and the CELT workshop. And this is what we're going to do. So at the start, this is what you do at the starter class. You load iClicker, you click start class, and then it's going to pop up right on the screen here. And this little thing you can move out of the way and just it's there whenever you want to do polling. Okay, so do we have so Maggie, Sorry, did you get John, nice can you say that do we need to have it specifically for each? We have to link iClicker to a specific class though, right? Yes. So you will set up an account for each class with the parameters for that class, and that will be linked to the, your Brightspace gradebook for that class. Okay. So so I have three set up. I'm only using one of them this semester because I'm only using it with my large class. I'm not using it with my online class. Now I can only see two, your, your econ classes, but I can't see the cell one on here. But... Well, that's because you have to use that join code because this oh. is not set up. Oh, this is not linked to the Oswego Brightspace instance. Okay. So we have one person in, <laughs> uh, let, let me see. Let me see, yeah, we have one attendee and we have one person who's connected, but is absent. <laughs> I, think that's, I think I'm absent. Yeah, I logged, I logged <laughs> into my, my instructor account. How do I find your uh, link here? Well, if you if you type this address in as the um, the code, if you type in this URL, actually, let me just hop from here and drop that into the chat. If you click on this, then you should be able to log in with your instructor credentials as a student. Um, I believe, or at least it worked that way when I last tried this. Um, oops, I went ahead there. I didn't mean to. Okay, so we've got three, four. Okay, we've got some progress. Okay, so now let's demonstrate this. And what I'm going to do now is have you answer this question and what you, your concerns are for the fall semester. And what we're doing here is we're going to do this as a poll, but we're going to leave this as an anonymous. So I'm going to turn anonymous on and I'm going to do a short answer response. So now what happens is that it grabbed the screen, it did a screen capture of that, and that goes into the gradebook so you can see what was being asked when these responses come in. And now, um, oops, yeah, there's a count up. And so far we have zero responses. We have one. And this is not a bad thing to ask students at the start of the semester. What are your concerns about this class? Or um, what are you most worried about or anxious about in this class? And then you can address some of those concerns right in the beginning. This is all anonymous. You can say whatever you'd like, <laughs> which can be scary in a large class when you do anonymous polling with 400 students. Now, by default, it won't display these unless you click on the results um, option, the results icon there. But if you want to watch them as they come in, if you click on that before you open the question, you can move it to a second screen if you have two screens in your classroom, or you could open up iClicker on your mobile device and have the results come in there so you can see them uh, at the same time as they're coming in. So I see we have three responses, so I'm going to... Um, I'm going to click on that. And these are the responses right here. Um, not figuring out the DLE. I think we all have had that concern at some point or another. Uh, I'm working on my own classes myself. Um, technological difficulties, certainly those can happen. Uh, burnout, <laughs> that's a phrase that we hardly ever hear more than 10 times an hour. <laughs> digital yeah, digital learning environment. Basically, it, yeah. It's Brightspace plus all the add-ons, things like iClicker and Hypothesis and, you know, the, the book integrations. And so, you know, and if you have a 
20 or 30 or 40 students, you'll often see some patterns. And what you could do is you could generate a word cloud. Now, that's not very helpful when none of the words occur more than once, but it will show the relative frequencies of some of those responses. And if you have a class of 400 students, you can see some patterns pretty easily, especially if you ask for one or two words or you know a short, a very short response. Um, and taking attendance, by the way, with iClicker is kind of automatic. It, you don't really have to take attendance, just ask some questions and the student participation will automatically be graded and it will automatically be keeping track of who is there and who isn't. Um, so, um, okay, so that's how this works. So we'll stop that question and we'll go back uh, and then you could get it out of the way again, if you'd like. And then let's go to another question about why you might wanna use polling. And, oh, Caitlin, go ahead. So I had a question. Um, I sure. had heard this from a previous professor here that said when taking attendance or putting up these questions, if you put them up ahead of time, like the students know you're gonna use iClicker and they can be in their dorms and still responding. So if you were doing that for attendance, um, I think there's like a GPS bubble you can set on that. Is that true? There is, and it doesn't work. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> the reason is it's tied to the address of your device, which is tied to whatever network connection you're using. And if you're on a wired connection in the classroom and students are in a wireless connection, that may show up on different places on the campus and may not show up being contiguous to your location. Uh, or students might be coming in through a mobile using a mobile data plan, even if they're sitting right in front of you, they may show up in Massachusetts or somewhere because that's where the AT&T or Verizon network connection is showing their location in the network. So it's there, but it would really, it, it doesn't work very reliably. I, okay. I had the same issue um, uh, previous semester. I tried to localize students and they said, well, you are in the middle of the lake. Um, and uh, and that's how it works from uh, Parker Hall. Uh, so the solution yeah. that I came up with was uh, display questions in class only uh, through PowerPoint and uh, run this separate. So uh, they don't they don't see they don't see questions unless they're in the classroom. They can't get any credit. Well, or they can answer the questions, but they wouldn't know what the questions were, so they'd get them all wrong, or they'd be more likely to get them wrong. Uh, so, um, because they could still connect to the class, but and they'd see the questions come up, but if you don't let them see your screen and they can only see it if they're physically there, they won't, they won't be able to participate. You know, they won't be able to know what the questions are, but they could still guess at it. And so it's not flawless. Um, okay, I think those, so are now, good, those are good workarounds though. Put it up separately, so. Mm -hmm. Oops, okay. So um, actually here, let's just do one more. Well, how might you use polling? Actually, yeah, let's do that. We're gonna do one more poll related to this. Again, short answer, we'll just start that. How might you use polling? What might you use polling for? Okay, we've got four responses here. Let's take a look. Uh, feedback, understanding checks. It's wonderful for that. You can check to see how student, what students are understanding and also let students know what they're understanding and getting immediate feedback in ways that wouldn't work as well if you're just asking individual questions um, or if you're asking them to do it on a higher stakes exam. Pre-testing uh, is really good. Participation, understanding, see what areas are causing confusion. So you could focus your class time more on those issues and do some just-in-time teaching where if everyone's understanding something, you don't have to waste time going over it. If a large proportion of the class is confused, you can use your time much more efficiently with it. Okay, good. 
Uh, and those are all really good uses. And now we're going to try a different type of question. Let me close those results. We're going to do now multiple selects. So the, partly this is done just so you can see the different types. Now here you could pick any answer that you'd like or choose all the answers that are correct. And you notice it says desktop captured. Again, it's grabbing an image of whatever's on the screen because that becomes what shows up in the gradebook. And if you share the screen with students, as I did in this case, but you don't have to do it. We'll go through that when we go through the setup. Um, you know, it, it will be displayed on student devices. Now, be, the reason why I share the questions with students when I do it, I recognize that some students won't be there. And I started doing that last year when I had, you know, sometimes 20 or 30 students out with COVID in the fall uh, in a class of a few hundred. Um, and, you know, I wanted them to be able to participate wherever they were. And so, and I also did this actually when we were still remote. Uh, and it was a nice way of letting students still participate, whether they happened to be on campus or whether they were in another country. And the reason why I shared the screen rather than just having them watch the Zoom screen if they were participating over Zoom is that if they were using a mobile device to access Zoom, switching back and forth between the polling device, the polling app, and Zoom would be a little cumbersome where they'd have to look at the Zoom screen to see what the question were and then go over and remember that and enter it on the iClicker app and then go back. Or if there was some calculations involved, it was just a little bit more cumbersome. So I generally shared it, you know, and just let students participate wherever they were. And there is an issue that some students may just do answer the questions without actually participating in any other way in class. But that could also be true for students sitting in the back of the room watching a baseball game or something on, on their device, um, which of course they never do, but uh, okay. So, uh, so let's, let's see how the results were. Um, and so, okay, the most popular responses were B and E. Um, and let's take a look at those, that it provides faculty with real-time information on student understanding, allowing you to give more effective and focused just-in-time teaching, which actually I just kind of said, didn't I? Uh, oops, and E went down one. Um, but you could also check in with students and how things are going. You know, you could do an anonymous poll, like how's this class working? What's working well? What are you having trouble with? Okay, and he came back up again <laughs> as, as uh, they got another vote. Uh, and we got three out of four votes for both B and E, and those are good uses. Um, Addressing student metacognition problems is actually one of the most important uses of polling because students will often read a text over and over and over despite all the evidence that suggests that rereading provide past the second reading, there's virtually no gain in what they recall. And they, they develop this, um, this perception of understanding, this illusion of understanding, because they recognize all the words, but they don't necessarily have a very deep understanding of it. And when you face them with problems or applications in class where it's not clear to them or it's not obvious to them um, what the answers are <laughs> or where, where they're not able to take what they've known and apply it to a practical problem or in a practical sense, it helps them become more aware that they didn't understand it quite as deeply as they thought they did. Um, so when students are asked questions and they get feedback on whether they're right or wrong, that helps them develop better skills in recognizing whether they understand something or not. And there is a fair amount of evidence on that. So I'd argue that A is true too. Now C is one which I've mentioned this in workshops going back like 12 or 13 years. And people generally didn't believe me on this until they actually used it. Because when you start a poll, especially if you allow them to do some pure discussion during it, it often gets really loud. And it, it, you wonder how they're going to bring students back to focus. But what happens is when students um, debate a question, when they're not sure of the answer and they're arguing with each other about this, it tends to focus their 
They've committed to an answer and they want to know what's correct. So they're really primed to accept some feedback. And what will generally happen if students' attention starts to wander and you do a polling question, it brings them right back to focus after you've gone through it. Either they recognize, oh, wait, I didn't understand this, or they're pretty happy that they did get it correct and they understood it and they're ready to move on. And Alex, you had your hand up. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but it hasn't let me put in a response for the last two questions. Um, oh, no. Yeah, it just says your answer, no response, and it doesn't let me answer. Um, but you were able to the first time? Uh, yes. That's bizarre. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Can you maybe refresh by like pulling down the menu? Yeah, are you using a mobile app? Uh, yes, I am. Um, yeah, maybe try refreshing because if your network connection drops or if you jump into another thing, you know, that sometimes happens. And I've had students have an issue where their network connection drops. And generally, I just have them refresh, refresh their screen or, um, or reconnect to the network. Um, and usually, yeah, that's probably all it is, I hope. Uh, because we've normally had very few problems with this. Like in a class of 400 students, I've had one or two students typically complain the first few days, unless there were network problems, which there used to be a lot of, but the last four or five years, they've been relatively rare. Um, um, and also choice D is not a bad one either, because you can also do this when you start a new topic and ask students what their preconceptions or what they think about a topic before you move on. Um, and also you can, there's a lot of research that suggests that doing some pre-testing, asking students about a topic that they have not yet studied forces them to think about it, to pull together what they've learned, to try to make sense of it. And it primes them to be able to to learn more. And that when you do this sort of pre-testing, uh, when you ask students questions before they've actually worked with some content, they're much more receptive. It, it provokes their curiosity and it makes it easier for them to start making connections. And it tends to deepen learning and resulting in more learning than when you don't do pre-testing. There are many, many studies of this. So actually all of these, there is some evidence for. So we'll try another one and see if that will work for you. Um, now here, an empirical question, which you, you know, again, I'm not expecting everyone to know this because, you know, you haven't read these studies probably. Um, but this one is, there's only one of these correct. So um, this is a multiple choice question and we will start the polling. And by the way, the classroom experiments were ones where classes were taught using equivalent presentations, except, um, and in some cases, the same instructors. Um, and students did the same readings. They were tested before the topic and then they were tested at the end. So they, they compared the pre-test and post-test scores in a treatment group where polling was used with clickers and in another group where there was some questioning of the class, but clicker use was not used. Alex, were you able to vote? Yes, I was. Okay, good. Okay, and we have five votes this time. Okay, so, <clears throat> and the most common one was C, and that would be good, but it turns out the correct answer is even better. Um, it's actually D, that uh, Eric Mazur found that there was a more than th slightly over 300% increase in the, the difference between pre and post test scores, Carl Wyman in chemistry found on average roughly a doubling of the scores. Um, in fact, in Carl Wyman's paper, you can see the distribution of scores on this, um, the, um, the post test. And in the group that used clickers, the whole distribution was shifted way over. So, um, it, it's a, the difference in distributions, and it was just dramatic. And that's probably true with call, with Eric Mazuris too, with the three hundred percent increase. He just didn't post the nice little histogram with so it. Scores are going from twenty percent to eighty percent. Well, so so let's say if if on the pretest the scores were the thirty, and then on the post test the scores was a thirty four um, without clickers, then it would be three times the gain. So instead of a four point gain, it would have been a twelve point gain. So, you know, it was pre and post test. It's not, 
uh, uh, comparing the statistics. It's comparing the, yeah, it's a difference in differences, okay. basically, uh, type approach, if that makes sense. So, and these are some of the most dramatic results. And in physics and chemistry, in general, the results have tended to be some of the strongest. But in virtually all disciplines, there have been some studies that found significant learning gains. And also, there have been some studies that find that these learning gains persist a year later uh, when the, st the students were followed up in classes that use clickers versus ones where they did not use clickers. Um, and even in disciplines where they did not find significant learning gains, which was fairly rare actually, they always found that students preferred the use of clickers. They found them much more engaging. Um, and here, just to illustrate a numeric response, and again, we're keeping this all anonymous, so, uh, oops, um, sorry. Uh, so I didn't mean to do that. I, went to, I meant to put in a numeric question here, and I will start the polling here. So suppose we had 100 students with COVID in the first week of the fall semester, and they're rising by 10% per week. Uh, how many new cases would we expect two weeks later? Two weeks Four responses. Again, it's anonymous. You can put any number in it. Doesn't <laughs> okay. And the results were 122, uh, 120, and 21. Um, well, 122 you, you is see, you you asked the question one way and it was displayed the other way. You asked how many additional cases, so that versus how many total new cases would there be? So oh yeah, okay, I you see. should you should interpret twenty one as one twenty one and you should interpret twenty as one twenty. It's your your oral question was different from the from the question. Oh the okay, screen. yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I guess I didn't phrase it very well there. But the basic point is, if they're growing by 10% per week, after one week, we'd expect 110. After two weeks, we'd expect 121, I think, right? Because it would be exponential growth. So, but these are, you know, okay. Um, okay, um, and now, sorry about that. Um, now, this is actually one I had used in my class. And here, I don't expect you, unless you worked in economics, to be able to um, be able to necessarily know what this one is. But it just displays a target response. Um, and if you have a map, if you have a um, piece of artwork, or if you have um, some type of an image and you want students to identify some component on it, students would just click on whatever part of the image would be correct. So, um, oh, I didn't start it, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's one of those days. Okay, so, um, so now you should be able to just click on the image in some part of it and that will show up as a series of dots in the results. Is it working? I'm sure it is. I'm just anxious because I. Oh, it doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't matter. This is, you know, you're you're not taking an intro micro class. Yeah, the target type of question is really nice. And that's, again, a nice feature of this that we wouldn't have if we were just using multiple choice type questions. We got four, four people clicking in. Don't worry about where you click. No one's, and again, it's all anonymous. <laughs> Okay, well, let's take a look. And what will happen here is 
three people clicked here. And those are in fact correct, um, that the total tax would be right here. Um, and this one's not too far off, but um, yeah. So, and now if this was, if this was actually a graded question, what you'd be able to do is in here, because it's anonymous, you can't grade scores because you don't know who had the responses. But if this was not anonymous, you'd be able to define a rectangle that would capture the correct answers. And then that would flag those as being correct and the other ones as being incorrect. And um, okay. And, and the basic issue here is if you introduce a tax, firms will, will increase the price they charge to consumers by the amount of the tax to make it worthwhile. And what will happen is the quantity sold will go down, the price that consumers pay goes up to here, the price that, um, I'm sorry, the price that consumers pay goes up, the price that producers pay go down, the difference is the amount of the tax and that red shaded area would be the, um, the total amount of the tax paid. Um, okay, in any case, so now, with iClicker Cloud, you still have the option of using physical clickers if you want to. But if you use physical clickers, you can only ask multiple choice questions. You lose multiple soups, you lose multiple select, and you lose free response, and you use that target type questions. And the other thing is students have to buy the clickers. Because we have a, a site license for iClicker Cloud, the use of that is free for students this year, um, or this semester at least, and I'm hoping that'll continue. CTS was paid for it last year and is paying for it at least through this semester. It costs the college $4 per student per semester, but if students had to buy it, they'd be paying $16 individually. So there's some really big advantage to that. Now, if students had to buy clickers though, they'd be paying up to like 42 or $43 for a new clicker, about 21 or $22 for a used clicker. And most students prefer free clickers. And they're also much more likely to show up in class with a mobile phone than they are to remember to bring the clicker or to make sure that they have batteries in their clickers. Um, and you get all these additional response types with that. John, important question. How do students access their site licenses? All they have to do is sign up for an account. And once the, sign as we go- for an account for what? For yeah. iClicker. Once they have that and they sign up for a class in Oswego, they're, they just get it for free. Students who, who register with an oswego.edu address with iClicker are not billed for the use of it. So they have to use an oswego.edu address. They, they have to, or, and if they didn't, it would not show up in okay. your gradebook anyway. So yeah, make sure you tell students they need to register with their oswego address. That's a good point. Uh, and another thing is, if you had used the older iClicker um, classic version, you had to bring a USB drive and people would forget them in the classroom or lose them or would run them through the washer or would sometimes corrupt the drives because they disconnected them without, um, without dis well, they pulled them out without disconnecting them and then I'd have to help people try to recover the data. It's all in the cloud, so all the data goes directly into the cloud, and it's it's much easier this way. You just log in in the classroom, and it's it was integrated with Blackboard, and now it is fully integrated in Brightspace, and we'll go through that in a minute. Um, physical clickers are more expensive for students, um, and you can't use them remotely, which some people argue is one of the strengths. They have to be within a, about three or four hundred feet of the classroom. Um, and some people have argued that they want to keep using physical clickers because they don't want to have students using the mobile phones or their laptops or other things, which can be distraction. Um, On the other hand, John, it, it, yeah. like you said previously, if, if students use their phone to participate in iClicker in your class, they cannot use their phone to do anything else. Exactly. exactly. And yeah, if you're having them using their phones productively, that's not a bad thing because <laughs> they're going to have their phones there anyway. And having them use them in a good, good way, a learning way is not a bad thing. Um, and there is a point it can be used anywhere on the web, which, you know, is a challenge if you want to make sure that students are in your classroom. Um, and and because students could access this from anywhere unless you try that geofencing and that just doesn't seem to work very reliably yet. Um, 
Uh, it does require a web-connected mobile device, but you know, it's been years since I've had a student in my class that didn't have a mobile phone or a laptop or a Chromebook. Um, and again, it's free this year. Um, if at some point we lose, if CTS stops paying for it, students would have to pay $16 for six months, $25 for a year, or $35 for two years, or $50 for four years, which is what I used to have students do anyway. And it's so much nicer not having this charge for, for this. Um, you know, if you want to use the physical clickers, you have to make sure that CTS installs one of the base stations in your classroom. Um, but if you want to do anything other than multiple choice, you need to use iClicker Cloud. Um, and again, if you want students to be able to attend remotely, you can use either platform, iClick or Classic or Cloud, but you, again, you're restricted to multiple choice only. So if we don't want to do multiple choice only, um, you have to use iClick or Cloud. Yes, yes. Because the only thing it can answer on the iClick or on the physical clickers would be multiple choice questions. Okay. And the nice thing is with the pandemic, most of the people who already bought clickers have graduated by now um, because we were using, most people were using this last year and we lost access because CTS took about a year to get the LTI integration working, um, except for those of us who did it without the LTI integration. Now, in terms of best practice with polling, and this is something that was developed by Eric Mazur and most people follow it, is you, you open a poll, you ask students to respond individually with no discussion, and that's not always easy to get in a large class, um, but then you look at the responses. And again, I've been displaying the responses here. I wouldn't do that if I was going to do a two-stage polling um, in a classroom. If I'm in a classroom where I have two monitors, I would have the results on the other monitor that only I could see and the students couldn't. Or again, um, when I was stuck in a classroom in Mahar where we didn't have two monitors, I just had my iPhone app open because you can do it as an instructor and have it logged in both on your computer and on your phone and you can see the results on the phone. Um, Eric Mazur suggests that questions should be set where roughly half the class will get them right. Uh, and then you ask them to discuss it with each other. So, you know, try to look at the responses before you, after the first round. If you find that 95% of the students got it right, you don't really need to spend time on a second stage discussion. You could just, you know, go through it, talk about it a bit and move on to the next question. If five or 10% of the students get it right, then you need to do some scaffolding and work back up. And, you know, you might find, might expect that with some questions and you might even build into your presentation some scaffolding, should it be needed? And, you know, you generally get a feel for that. Um, or you could start with the scaffolding right away if you expect that. Um, but if you get roughly 30 to 85% of the questions correct um, in the first round, ask students to discuss it. What I'll normally do is, talk to the people around you, try to find someone with a different answer and convince them that your answer is better and then listen to their explanation of why they think their answer is better. And you can get a really good discussion going on right then. Um, some of us had seen Eric Mazur actually about five or six years ago here. And he gave this wonderful presentation where he, um, he handed out clickers to all the faculty attendants and he had a picture of a metal plate. Some of you have heard this before, a metal plate with a hole in it. And he asked what happens to the, he explained why things expand when they're heated up. And he said, what happens to the size of the hole in this metal plate if I were to heat it up to 400 degrees? Will it become larger or smaller? He had people vote on that. Then he had them discuss it and it became this really loud discussion in the classroom. Then he had them vote on it again. And then he said, and now, you know, look at what happened here. If I were to lecture you on what happens to the size of a hole in a metal plate, if I heated it up, it would be about the most boring lecture you could imagine. And none of you would remember this. But now that you've all taken a stand on this, you're really engaged in this and you now have a position on it. And that's why clickers can work really well. And then he went on to his next point and people got angry. They were yelling at him that wanted to know what happened which just which he had staged just to get that to happen because 
people were now curious about something because they had taken a position on something that normally they wouldn't even think about. And it was a great way of illustrating how clickers can provoke curiosity and can promote that sort of engagement. And by the way, the whole expands. <laughs> so, um, but it was interesting to see that work in practice. Um, and then do the poll again in the next stage. Okay, and then once you do the poll, ask students why they chose their responses and then provide some feedback and so forth. Um, okay, so before we go through the setup of this, any questions? Let me stop the share. Any questions on any of this? You've never okay, had a, then, oh, can okay, I ask one real quick? Ahead. You've never had sure. like a, um, a student come in and, cause it's all over Wi-Fi. So like the mobile data shouldn't be an issue, right? It's really low bandwidth though. You know, they're just transmitting a numeric response. It's not like they're using, it's not like they're watching videos or, you know. Okay. So it's, you know, an image, if you set it up so that it shares the screen image, you know, you got to, maybe a couple of K going out of data for the image, but you're just sending back the a numeric response. It's, it's less than texting would normally be. Well, about what texting would normally be with short text. Okay, so now let's go through the actual setup of a class. And um, I should have just left the screen shared, um, but let me go to, um, let me just open up, come on. There we go. Uh, let me go back to, um, and this would be good if you could do this too. Let's just go back to iClicker. Uh, yeah, I, I'm here. Okay. So um, you know, let me just go back. So I'm gonna just gonna go to iClicker. Well, I'll search for iClicker Cloud, log back in here, um, make this smaller. And now I'm gonna sign in again. Um, this time I'm gonna sign in as an instructor. Um, well, actually I did before too. And I've got my credentials saved, so I'm just going to sign in. And now I'll create a new course. Um, and here it's going to ask you if it's a full course or attendance only. Attendance only is if you only want to do it for attendance. If you want to do it for attendance, so there's no reason to really ask students to download the app. There's other tools like Quickly you could use for attendance. You could use Google Forms or other things. Um, the advantage of attendance only is it's free for students, but for us, using it with all of its features is free for students. So sign up for the full course um, and then type in your institution name um, so that it, they know it's at as we go. You type in the discipline of your course, you select your course, from the full list there. Um, and I don't know if, I think there's enough there. So you could probably find something close if yours, well, you have other. So you could always type in other if it doesn't work. Um, give it a name of the course. Um, let's say, uh, let's suppose I'm going to use this for my Echo 40. Um, I'll pick one of my spring classes. Um, Uh, mathematical economics. Well, I should put in the. There we go. Um, and then you put in your start and end dates. I'm going to put this in in the spring. And I'll say it's going to start on January. I have no idea when the spring semester starts, but let's say it's going to end sometime in May. Let's say May 23rd. Um, now here, you should leave it as a default that students can search for and self-enroll in the course. So once they create an account, it will show up in their choices once they choose SUNY as we go. So um, the, the invitation would be used only if you're doing something separate from your course, like that work well, I did for this workshop where you got that invitation code where you could do a meeting just or a poll for just that purpose. And then the rest of this is optional, but you could put in a short ID. Let's say I'll just type in here, Echo 409. The term, let's say is spring um, 2023. Um, and then you could put in the meeting times. All that's optional, you know, in the bottom part here. But if you're teaching multiple sections, so if you have one section at 910 and one at 10, 1020, um, you may want to put in the days of the week and the meeting times just so students don't sign up for the wrong section because they may not remember the section number, but they're more likely to get the, the meeting times correct because they'll see all that when they're choosing which courses to sign up for. 
So once you've done that, you just click create and that will create the course. And then after you've created it, you could then go in and edit it. And to edit it, everyone up to that point? Everyone okay there? I'll assume so, unless I hear. Um, and so, um, so once you do that, you now go to click on the course among the courses you have there and click on settings, okay? And some that'll start with the information you just input, but now you can set up more. And the first thing it asks you is what type of devices. And here you could allow iClicker remotes and mobile devices or just one or the other to make it less expensive for students and to give you the most flexibility. I would suggest using iClicker um, mobile devices only, sorry. Um, but if you, know, if you really don't want students to have mobile devices, you could choose iClicker remotes only, but then they'd have to buy them. Um, and you're limited to multiple choice, but that's, that's up to you. Um, now, in the mobile device settings, there is a student focus and a focus option. It's a beta, um, it's a beta option. And what that will do basically is it will show you what proportion of class time students were in the iClicker app. So if it's on a mobile device, it will show you how, how, what proportion of the class time they were actually using the app compared to other things. Now, if, if for example, they're going to be using a calculator to ask questions, or if you're having them look something up, or if they're going to be doing some computations or something, you might not expect them to stay in the iClicker app all the time. If you're going to be using you know, mobile apps for things other than just this, you probably don't want to turn this on. Um, you know, and Students might also be looking terms up or other things, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's a very crude measure of focus, but if you want, you can turn it on. It doesn't show up in anything in the grade book or anything else, except you get to see what proportion of the time they were focused on and they do. I haven't used that, but you're welcome to do it. If you um, are using, well, let's just go with the mobile devices only because that's what most people have been using. Um, attendance. You do have the option of automatically keeping track of attendance and you can set the number of time getting a highlighted color for students who are absent more than say three times in the semester or something and they'll see that. You can even set attendance to auto run. Um, so for example, if your class always meets at 10, 20 Monday, um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you could set it up to auto run attendance on those class days, which you specified earlier if you chose those times. Um, and then it will automatically see who's logged in. Although it will show students as being absent on days when there's a holiday or you know something else going on, or on days when you didn't use clickers, if you had an in-person test, for example. I don't generally do that, but you could. Um, here, you could require and set location for attendance, but you're going to get all sorts of students complaining that it's not working for them and that they were there. I would, rec I would recommend not doing this, but, but you're welcome to try it. It doesn't do any harm other than it may get some students annoyed that it's not reporting what they perceive to be accurate. The more important settings here are under polling. And this is a question that Kestis mentioned uh, earlier. Now, I normally set it to share the screen with students when polling starts, just in case they are attending remotely and they're using Zoom, because in a class of 400, there's going to be some students who can't be there for any number of reasons. And I do allow them to attend remotely. Um, and you know, so it's just easier for them if they're working with one device to see the question on the screen. If you want to make sure that they are physically present and there's a lot of good reasons to do that, you would say, do not send a picture of your screen. All they would see is, you know, if it's a multiple choice, they see A, B, C, D, or E. If it's a free response, they just see a text box and so forth. Um, I, I don't know what would happen with the image maps. I guess the image maps you'd have, if you're using image map, you'd probably have to share the picture. I'm, I haven't tried that um, because I, I generally do. Now, 
here, the default is to automatically send the results, the polling distribution when polling ends. This is one that I turn off because I'd rather choose when to share the results and do it by from within the polling app itself so that students can see the, the histogram of the responses when I want them to. And because I use two-stage polling most of the time, I don't want them to see how people voted in the first stage because that would bias their their discussions in that, you know, in that peer discussion stage. And what the what the research shows is that most of the learning gains occur through that peer discussion. That you know, when people just do polling just as a way of quizzing, there's very little improvement in student recall um, or either in the short term or long term. But when they interact with each other and they engage with each other and they explain things to each other, that's where we tend to see most of the learning. So I don't do that. And I only explicitly share the results on the screen when, when I'm ready to, after they've done the final stage of the polling. Now, in terms of scoring, if you're going to have questions that you want graded, um, there's two ways of doing this. One is you could just do participation grades. And I know some faculty have chosen to do that where they just wanna get student views on things and there are not necessarily right or wrong answers. Um, and then you could give students participation. You could get them any number of participation points in each day of class. And the options are if they answer all the questions, all except for one, at least three quarters, at least half, or at least one question, if you just wanna let them show up for one question. Um, I normally set that to zero and do it based on their responses. And if I don't wanna measure their responses, I just use an anonymous poll. Um, but, but again, some people just wanna say, you get full credit if you answer all questions or if you answer three quarters of the questions or whatever, that's up to you. Um, and again, it's, you know, it can work quite well. Um, now, what I normally do here is I use these two settings um, because I follow Eric Missouri's recommendation of trying to get questions where about half the students will get it right. I don't want to have them on average getting a 50% on this. You know, that could be a bit discouraging. I want to be able to ask challenging questions. What I normally do in my class, at least, is I give three points for just any response, whether it's correct or not. And then the points for the correct response, this is really easy to misunderstand. It's actually the number of additional points you get when you answer the question correctly. So I normally will do three points for any response and then a total of five points if they answer it correctly. So if they answer everything wrong, but they at least were there and they tried, they get a 60% for the day. If they answered everything correct, they get 100%. If they answered half correct and half incorrect, they'd end up with an 80. Now, most of them with the two-stage process will end up with more than an 80 because even if the first stage, half the class gets it right, in the second stage, that normally goes up 10 or 15%. So it tends to be a bit higher with that. But, but that's up to you. Um, you know, you can try what works. You can change it, but what matters is how it's set at the start of your class. So if it's not working in the next class you can change the settings to either participation or with scores for individual polling questions some faculty will put one point for responding and an additional point if they respond correctly so you get half credit if you do if you provide any response you get full credit if you respond correctly um, you could choose whatever weight you'd like there if if you choose to do it that way you could also just do a fixed points um, which is to equalize the weight of each day. Because there are some days, for example, when I might ask eight questions and other days where I might ask 12. Um, and I have more points on some days than others, and I'm fine with that. <clears throat> but if you wanna have a fixed number of points for each day, you could assign each day by default to be five points, for example. And then you know that'll be a percent of that, depending on how many questions. So it's basically weighting each class equally rather than each question equally over the course of the semester. Um, you could also do that in Brightspace too, by adjusting whether it's a weighted average or whatever. Okay. but. Um, I don't do that. I just do it based on the number of correct uh, answers they have. Now, here you can do a count up or a count down. When we did the polling there, I use a count up. And with a small group, that can work really well. 
if you got a really large class, though, you might want to try a countdown. And I usually start the semester with like a minute and a half and then bump it down a little bit as students become a little more adept at logging in, getting connected and responding. Uh, normally, I'll start the class at about a minute and a half and then drop it down to a minute and a quarter and then sometimes down to a minute if students are able to get connected more quickly. And it depends on how well the network is working in your building. It depends on you know, how quick students are able to pick up their phones and, um, and log into the service and get connected. And when you're doing the polling, you always have the advantage if you're doing a countdown of clicking on a little up arrow and extending the time if it's taking longer for whatever reason. So if students got disconnected from Wi-Fi and they need to reconnect, you could just add an extra 15 or 30 seconds or whatever you'd like. Um, and, then, um, and then the next step is quizzing, which is only relevant if you're going to put in multiple choice, well, multiple choice or free response or other type quizzes that are done asynchronously, where instead of just having one question, students can log in and do the quiz later. Or, um, well, I don't do that because we've got so many quizzing tools already. Um, but, but you're welcome to. And you know you could always set it up where you have all the questions you use in class as an asynchronous clip quiz if you're doing something with HyFlex, for example. Um, but the most important thing now and the new part now is the integration. And here, it, right now it says Blackboard and Brightspace. Ignore Blackboard. We no longer will have access to that this semester. Well, our students won't. So click on Select LMS and Connect. Choose SUNY Brightspace. And then what will happen is it's going to lock you into Brightspace and it's going to, because I was already logged in doing some work in my class, it's not going to ask me to authenticate. I'm already authenticated. It will ask you to authenticate, to log in, to use that really annoying authentication app for the seventh or eighth or ninth time of the day um, and just authenticate. And then it will show you all of your active classes and, um, if you have not opened your class yet, you would click on unpublished. And so these are my unpublished classes, which really need to be published really soon uh, for this semester. So you would just click whichever course was there. And then I'm not going to do that though, because I don't want this to show up as, well, one of my classes is already set up. Um, and the other one is not going to be using it because it's an asynchronous John, class. Yes. I have a quick question and I'm sure. going to have to leave because I have something at three. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking at my published courses and I'm seeing two courses, one that's with the same number, one that says 202 FA and then one that just says OSW 20209. Oh, that's your conversion course? That's probably the converted one, the one that came from Blackboard. So it's the 22 um, FA. Yeah, you'll want the that's the one that I want? Perhaps. Yes. The 22FA mm -hmm. is the one that I've built, not the converted one? Right. Um, correct, because the converted one's not linked to your roster, from my understanding. That's just where you would move things from that conversion, that converted course to your fall 2022 course. Right, because I have I created a brand new one from scratch. Long story short, I didn't use the converted class. Okay. I built a new one. OK, then yeah, it should be the 22FA one is probably the one you built from scratch. OK, thank you. And then once you do that, there should be an option to sync your roster, and that will load all of your students. It would tell you which ones already have iClick accounts set up and which ones need to, and it will update that as they sign into your course. And to sign into your course, all they need to do basically is to, um, is to sign up for an account. And when they sign up for, they search for their institution and then search for their, um, you know, search for their instructor and course section. Thank you. I got to have to leave. Okay. Well, that, we're mostly done. And the only other thing is syncing grades and that we can't really show yet because we don't have any here. But basically you go to the website and each day after you do a polling session and you mark which ones are correct, which you can do while you're polling, by the way, by just clicking on the correct answer when you're displaying the histogram, or you could go in to um, the iClicker app itself and look at the grades. 
make sure everything that's correct is flagged as correct, and then just sync, uh, select the sync option, and it will sync the grades with Brightspace's gradebook, and it will create, a, oh, one other thing it asks, and I, I almost forgot this, is when you do the sync, or when you set it up in Brightspace, it will ask you if you want to, for the name of the column, or if you want to have separate columns for each class day. Most people would prefer having separate columns for each class day, which is not the default. Um, if you only want to have one column with a running total of student scores, then leave it at the default. But if you want to have different scores for each day, which students generally prefer, because they like if they missed a day, they'd like to know which one it is. And it's a whole lot easier for us when students say, well, I haven't missed any days. And then you can say, well, you actually missed, you know, Tuesday, February, you know, October 12th or whatever. Um, and then they say, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, but having separate columns make it easier for students to see which days they missed and which ones they didn't. And it makes it easier for us to look at without having to go into the iClicker app to track it down because it'd be right in Brightspace. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? So I heard today from one of my colleagues in chemistry that um, D2L, all students are identified exclusively by D2L uh, or Brightspace ID. And all the grades that are there will be close to impossible to transfer into Oswego's system because they don't have student IDs. Is that correct or is it a wrong statement? I have not checked that yet. If they don't have student IDs, they should still have student email addresses and that should be enough to be able to do a linkage with, with Banner. Because all we need is one field. We either need their student ID number or we need their email address or the net IDs. And I think it certainly should have the net IDs. So uh, yeah, so that's a concern that was brought uh, by Casey Raymond. I don't know if you want to explore and address it because of course, if, if uh, that makes Brightspace very uncomfortable to use because if at the end you have to manually transfer the grades, then it's gonna be you know a waste of time really. So that would be for midterms and final grades. Correct. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I had a really small class this summer, so I just typed them in, um, you know, so I wasn't worried about that. But now SUNY is using a SUNY global ID, which they created just for this purpose, because the ID numbers we have are often the same as those used at other institutions. And that's why they had to create a new one. But um, I don't know what possibilities there are for that. And that's, that is a good question. And Casey generally checks these things out pretty carefully. So I'm not sure. That's an issue that'll have to be addressed. It may just mean that our banner instance will have to add another field in order to get the matching with the SUNY global ID. So that may require some updates but yeah, I don't want to, when I have a class of 400 students this fall, I don't want to have to be typing in all the grades. I, I did that a decade ago and would rather not do it again. I'm sure we can sort them by, let's say, family name, but it's still a bother. Right. It, it should, it it's should a, be it's a nuisance. easier than yeah. that. Oh, a couple other things we didn't talk about. Um, one is when we do this, there are, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, do not end. There's a couple of other settings here. Um, where were they? Uh, oh, when we do the poll, under more here, there are some things we didn't talk about. You normally wouldn't leave anonymous on with your class if you want to grade it. Here you can toggle between countdown and count up, but this is something we didn't talk about that we should at least mention. It's a confidence rating where students are asked not only for a response, but also how confident they are of the response, which can also be used to help improve metacognition. Because if students think that they really, they were really confident about their answer and they find out they're wrong, that might force them to readdress that a little bit. Or it will let us know also what students felt really comfortable with and what they didn't. And you know, 
if students are just nervous and they, they're, they're not con sufficiently confident, this might help boost their confidence, but it should help improve their metacognition about what they know and what they don't know, or at least that's, that's the purpose of it. So you can turn that on. It's a new feature that just came out in the middle of the spring semester. And when you're done, you just um, close this up, click end, and it gives you the option of an exit poll where you can just ask students for any post-class feedback or not. You can either end the class or end it with an exit poll. We'll just end, end this. And then um, click the X when you're done and then go back to your office, check the, the scores, mark the answers correct if you haven't already done so, and sync it with your gradebook, and it's all set up. Everything else is pretty much like it was before. It works pretty smoothly, generally. <laughs> now I say that without actually used it with the class and having grades to transfer, but the integration was really simple. All my students came over. And also I had about 15 of them, even though it's a freshman level class who already had accounts. So they must be sophomores who happened to use it. Maybe in another economics class last year, uh, but. Any questions? A quick question about Brightspace. Uh, sure. So I just managed to integrate it, uh, which, which was, I couldn't earlier um, for whatever reason. Um, in regard of Brightspace, are graduate and undergraduate classes separate? How do I find my graduate classes on Brightspace? They should all be there. I don't know. Because I email my regular class and uh, my graduate students have not received that email. That's what they claim. I mean, I don't know, maybe that's not accurate, but that's what they claim. So I'm, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I didn't know um, extended learning or. Ex yeah, the help desk would probably yeah. be the best place, yeah. or even the graduate school. Yeah, but yeah. probably extended learning, you know, or yes. help at us, we go .edu would redirect it to the Brightspace support people. Right. Um, it's possible that maybe the grad students weren't loaded in there and the undergraduates were because they, the, the process of loading them was not fully automated in, in, in Banner and it did require some extra work. And I know one institution yesterday loaded everyone into their um, fall classes before the fall classes opened. It they don't open for two more weeks and they were a bit surprised and they opened all the classes when they were trying to get things set up. So it's it's a new experience for everyone. And there's been a lot of fumbling <laughs> along the way. But it'll get better. But I haven't, I, I'm not teaching any graduate classes. So I and I haven't heard that. But again, I haven't been talking to too many people. I've been mostly in hiding. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, I'll stop the recording. This was so much better than us just talking to ourselves.